everyone. Welcome back to season two of the Minute Women podcast. My name is Grace. And I'm Linnea. It's very exciting. We're back. Yeah, this is our first episode of our brand new season. Yeah. We're like, I feel so professional. I know. It's going to look really nice we're on not the just, iTunes. And we're not just making episodes. We have seasons. We have seasons. It's legit. This is a legit podcast. Yeah, we're really taking the podcast in a brand new riveting direction with this second season, by which the format has not changed and we are still talking about Canadian Heritage Minutes. Exactly. <laughs> it's uh, exactly the same, but uh better. Potential for growth. Potential for growth. Yeah. Who knows what could lie ahead? It's new true. guests. Maybe sponsors. Live shows. New Heritage Minutes. Guess what, Linnea? What, Grace? We have a sponsor this week. No. We don't actually know, but wouldn't it be incredible if your ad was right here on the Minute Women podcast? Hi, my name is Grace. (laughs) (laughs) Hi, sponsor, the Minute Women podcast. Uh, I approve this message. We approve this message. Yeah. 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 It would be great, though. Yeah. It would be amazing. If you are a business and you want to have your ad read, we have, you know, Anybody. You can pay us to say anything. We'll say <laughs> We it. have no integrity. <laughs> like if the Maple Syrup Mafia wants oh. to sponsor this podcast, they can. It would be the sweetest commercial this side of Montreal. But um Yeah. <laughs> I love that. But yeah, seriously. We uh <laughs> <laughs> please. Please, we're starving please artists. Sponsor us. We are. We're gonna have to live as ourselves soon enough. Ugh. They call us the Minute Women because we probably have about a minute to live. So. <laughs> oh. Oh, we laugh, but it's painful. <laughs> anyway, and then we cry. Um, we yeah. have a sorry segment this week. We do have a sorry segment. Um, a sorry slash shout out segment yeah. to the listener. Uh, we can actually we can start off with that. So, yeah, we actually got an email from a listener named John. Hi, John. Hi, Thank John. you so much. Uh, he said lots of nice things. Very he nice loves things. Our- he knows me from high school debating. Yeah. Which, which was so bizarre. Hilarious. <laughs> he also said I was really good at it. So, oh. hi, John. <laughs> Grace just flipped your hair for everyone who couldn't see that. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, girl loves a compliment. I do. Um, I do. Yeah, so he sent us this lovely email, uh, which we were super happy to receive. Yeah, it was very sweet. Uh, But he also did talk about our Viola Desmond episode, and so he actually is a teacher now, Mm -hmm. and he wanted to discuss that we had talked about that Rosa Parks uh, had just chosen to to, take her seat and not not get up and move to a separate section, when actually uh, the... NAACP, uh, which was headed by Martin Luther King Jr., actually chose Rosa Parks. Yeah, it was an that. organized protest. It was organized, yeah. So it had previously happened. There was actually a woman before Rosa Parks, and I don't think he mentions her name, but I did look this up after. Uh, so that woman was actually Claudette Colvin. She was a teenager, and she was actually pregnant at the time. Yeah. And so they had kind of decided the like the organized protesting group had decided you know that wasn't the face the of face the face that protest. they were going to yeah. use. So they chose Rosa Parks, who was a who was a huge advocate for um, Black Lives and a friend of Martin Luther King's. And he was like, you know, you're a sweet, educated, <laughs> like unassuming, right, uh, older woman. She would be like. She would represent what white society would deem as like a black person, like exactly. a good black person. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so they, yeah, so she was actually chosen. So we had talked right. about Rosa Parks and we just wanted to, yeah, apologize clarify and clarify uh, and clarify that we missed that. And it was kind of something afterwards, as soon as we got this email, Grace and Mark and I were all like, <laughs> oh, like we totally Literally have heard that, that before. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it just goes to show, as I've said on this podcast a hundred times probably, mm-hmm. that I actually don't know what the episode is. <laughs> and, you know, so like Grace kind of talks about it and Mark and I, and it's it's different. Grace is talking about it from what she's researched. So yeah. if I go off on a tangent and bring up something else, like it's not something we've had time to like yeah. look at background for. So, But hence why, yeah. you know... Listener feedback is so important. So yeah. thank you very much to John for so, pointing that out and so we could correct it. Uh, but John also did want to give a little shout out to me personally and <laughs> say that the Roseland, um, the cabaret, like the... <laughs> yeah, the 
the and, and the vil are and the vil and Wolfville are very similar, similar vibes. vibes. <laughs> I have to go to. I think I have to go to the vil now, or maybe uh, I'll go to the Roseland. I don't know if that one's still oh open. Oh gosh. Though. Um. Yeah. So when you were explaining that, I was like, Yeah, it sounds like a, like a historical <laughs> monument here, like a used condom there. Like <laughs> that's just. Uh, that that's the like vibe. A wonderful institution. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so yeah. yeah, again, thank you so much, John, John. And, and to you. Yep, we're, we're sorry. sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. All right. Do you want to get into the first episode of season I, two of Minute Women? I sure do. I'm so excited. All right. So season I, two. Season two is when like TV shows get like you know better makeup and better like clothing and we're still they, in the same building <laughs> they have and better set design like not I think us big things are coming though but big things are coming yeah yeah i can feel it we should have done like a tarot card reading or something we should have but we didn't we didn't we didn't so, prep <laughs> here we are what is what am i learning about today so i wanted to do just like a classic vintage i'm excited minute so we're doing jenny trout oh okay Great Heritage Minute. Great Heritage Minute. Which, it is one, looking back as a kid, it's like, well, it's, so Jenny Trout is the first licensed female doctor in yep. Canada, and so it's her and her friend Emily who are taking a medicine class at the University of Toronto, and mm-hmm. all of the men are, like, heckling them because they're learning about male genitalia yeah. in the class, and they refuse to, like, show the organ on their, like, their their demonstration so they have like a leaf covering it yeah literally like from the bible or something and they're like we have to get these women out and in the minute they're like well i'm sure they have sex with their husbands but you know (laughs) we're not we can't have these ladies and then she just like stands up and she's just like i will report to higher ups that you're acting this way and she like rips the leaf off and then they like storm out of the class and then everyone's like (gasps) and they're like a penis (laughs) so do you remember watching this heritage minute as a kid I do, yeah. Do you remember? Like, because to me, I didn't understand what it was about. I think this is one of the ones that it's just like, because it doesn't feel like a classroom. Like, it's a kind of a Victorian style auditorium. And so there's a lot going on. And there's a lot of arguing and yelling in the minute. So Mm -hmm. for me, I think it's one of the ones that highlighting a person that I didn't know about, but I also didn't at least as a child, fully appreciate what the minute was about. Yeah, and it's one I distinctly remember, like, asking my mom, being like, what's going on? She's like, they didn't want the girls to see the boys' private parts. But they're doctors, so it doesn't make sense, right? And I was like, right. Right. Uh, Yeah, yeah. and, I mean, as we'll go through, Jenny Trout, it's actually really interesting, I think, that they chose to feature her because she's a figure that, really wasn't very well known leading up to this minute. Okay. So she kind of gets lost in Canadian medical history for a long time. Mm-hmm. And then she's kind of rediscovered in the 1970s. Okay. And so then this minute, I believe, is one of the really early 1990 ones. Mm. So she she would have been a relatively new figure in the Canadian kind of zeitgeist of, of okay. medical history. Right, so, right. Yeah. So kind of like how we did in our Penfield episode where we talked a bit about the history of how epilepsy was treated. We're also going to talk a bit about women in the medical profession over time Mm -hmm. because it's not as black and white of like men were always doctors and women were not doctors. And then suddenly in the early 20th century, women started to enter the medical field. It's actually a lot of like ebbs and flows of how women participate in the field of medicine. And then we'll get into like Jenny Trout's specific story. So you're ready to get into the episode? I sure am. Okay. So, the history of women in medicine is about as long as the history of medicine itself. Early human civilizations have records of female physicians. From ancient Egypt, the tomb of Merit Ptah was inscribed with chief physician and is the earliest written record of a woman named in the history of science, let alone medicine. Mm -hmm. So that's like tens of thousands of years ago, I believe. That's cool. The poet Homer cites Agamede as a healer in ancient Greece before the Trojan War. Egodici was the first female physician to practice legally in 4th century BC Athens. Metrodora was a physician and is widely considered the first medical writer in the Western tradition of medicine for her book on the diseases and cures of women. And sorry, this is a, a very Western history of medicine, but I mm-hmm. felt like that's the that's the tradition that Jenny 
kind of enters into. Right. So I thought that was probably better. But you also have throughout kind of like the Islamic um, history of medicine, Mesoamerican, Asiatic, there are female physicians since really the earliest human civilizations. Yeah. That's very cool. The Middle Ages is often remembered as a period of stagnation for both culture and science. However, women continued to work in medicine throughout the Middle Ages in Europe. Convents were an important place for the education of women, and some of these communities provided opportunities for women to contribute to scholarly research in various scientific fields like medicine, botany, and natural history. That's cool. But women in the Middle Ages participated in many healing techniques and capacities outside of convents as well. So we tend to think of it as like, well, if you gave up being a woman in the sense that you're not going to be a wife and you're not going to be a mother, then you could go and be a nun and then you can participate right. in science. Well, it's funny, too, because, you know, when you're thinking about uh, kind of how medicine and like that science mm-hmm developed you kind of think about botany and then you think about like when people talked about like witches or like healers yeah. or like apothecary stuff and that yeah. was traditionally women yeah for um, sure like that kind of natural remedy medicine like through, yeah like cooking or that's very much like, a like i feel like a medicine place. woman is something yeah. that culturally we're very aware of but we don't yeah. really know the history of it yeah, or how legitimate true. it was yeah it's very true yeah There were plenty of women serving as herbalists, midwives, surgeons, barbers, and nurses, which barbers is also a medical field during this period of time. Did you know that? Like cutting people's hair? Yeah, but they're also like, they would be like barber surgeons. So basically anything that required cutting, like if you needed your leg amputated, you go to the barber. Oh. Yeah, that's why if you know the barber poles, the red and white stripes... That's meant to be bandages and blood. That's the origins of a barber sign. What? Yeah, yeah. Crazy. That's crazy. So if you're like, you go into the shop one day and they're like, what do you need? Just a little off the top? And they're like, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the names of 24 women described as surgeons in Naples between 1273 and 1410 are known, and references have been found to 15 women practitioners, most of them Jewish, and none dis- described as midwives in Frankfurt between 1387 and 1497. So it, it's basically meant to say, like, women occupied a really diverse role in medicine, I think, typically we're like, oh, well, they were just all midwives. It's like, no, like they were surgeons. They were participating in a lot of different fields. And they were also coming from other minority groups. Like the vast majority of these 15 female practitioners in Frankfurt were Jewish. Yeah. And none of them were midwives. So it's, it's just meant to show that like women occupied a lot of different spaces. Women also did engage in midwifery and healing arts without leaving any trace of their activities in written records and this is typically because they're practicing in rural areas or practicing in places that have very little access to medical care in general right so i mean you could be a midwife but it's not like you have to get a license to be a midwife so you will have no record of that person participating in medicine Society in the Middle Ages, however, began changing to exclude women from practicing medicine. So that's the thing. It's, it's a conscious decision to start excluding women from the practice of medicine. It's not like, you know, societal roles are changing. It's, it's quite, you can see the shift Some happen quite never quickly. Change. Yeah. And it's when you start to institutionalize education is right. that's when women can no longer. It's almost when you don't have written rules around an institution that more people are able to engage with it because mm-hmm. there's no black and white yeah. there. But once so once universities are established, faculties of medicine were they usually start popping up in the 13th century and women are explicitly excluded from advanced medical education at this point. So someone can present you with a piece of paper that says like, look, I'm a doctor. But that practice, while you can standardize medicine. Right also allows people to start excluding women yeah because if you are a woman who's expected to like be at home and can't attend university then you can't get the certifications that you need to then exactly oh yeah that's crappy so 
licensing began to require clerical vows for which women were ineligible. So within the Catholic Church, women are not allowed to take clerical vows, right. which means they can't get a university degree. And healing as a profession became male-dominated as a result. Yeah. Surgeons and barber guilds often excluded women as well. So once you start to have guilds, which are like early forms of unions, they'll be like, right. oh, and women are not allowed to participate. Oh, and uh, <laughs> last last note of order, <laughs> no girls allowed. And no girls. What? <laughs> it's like, yeah, no girls. This is our clubhouse. Damn. No girls allowed. <laughs> However, there are some records of female guild members in towns like Lincoln, Norwich, Dublin, and York throughout the British Isles. Mm -hmm. Women often had to fight against accusations of illegal practice after this point. If they were not accused of malpractice, women were risked being accused of witchcraft by both clerical and civil authorities. Mm -hmm. Which, yeah, it's like the that notion of like the female healer becoming a witch, it becomes more common after you have institutions we deem to think more enlightened. So it's right. it's with the creation of universities that we start trying to label people witches. It's not because people became more educated we stopped calling people witches. Right. It's like the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> All of this combined to dissuade women from joining the medical profession. Uh-huh. The last vestige of women in medicine in Western Europe was midwifery. So that tends to be, I think, what people think of when they think of, like, female yeah. healers. Midwives, those who assisted pregnant women through childbirth and some aftercare, included only women for a very long time. Midwives... Because only women can look at other women down there. Yeah. And it's just, <laughs> like... <laughs> I mean, it's such a stereotype of, like, dads being like, no, I yeah. want to see, I want to see. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, I can't. Yeah. It's that. It's just them going, ew, gross. I remember that's one thing my mom told me, like, when she was having me, <laughs> that she, that they were like, oh, like, do you want a mirror so you can see? And my mom was like, no. no. Why the Absolutely heck would I want to see that? not. No. So I remember when my mom had my little sister, I was much older, and, uh, my stepdad, they, like, asked him the same thing. And my mom was like, he does not want to see. No. Like, he's going to stay up here by my head. <laughs> and that is the only place he will be. <laughs> it's like you, as a nurse or a doctor, are getting paid good money yeah. to deal with that. You think he's going to do it for free? Yeah. No. Absolutely <laughs> Just, not. He's going to hold my hand while I make it bleed. You stay down there. <laughs> I'll stay up here. Stay up here. <laughs> uh, tell me how beautiful I am. Anyways. <laughs> Midwives constituted roughly one-third of female medical practitioners. However, even this came under attack eventually. As medicine became increasingly considered a science more than an art, midwives were not considered trained medical professionals. Even though it's like, like you would become a midwife basically through apprenticeship. Like right. you basically just deliver a bunch of babies. It's trial by fire. You just deliver yeah. babies constantly, and that's how you become a midwife. And figure some things out. Yeah, you I know. need I need six towels, not two. Yeah, it's like to um, be honest, I'd rather someone who's delivered thousands of babies than someone who just got fresh out of med school. Yeah, a hundred percent. A major shift occurred when male medical associations started to favor the growth of male-dominated fields like gynecology and obstetrics uh, over midwifery. Yeah. Which those fields are roughly, like, those are the scientific versions of yeah. midwifery. It's, it's OBGYN. Yeah, so it's exactly. Like if you're, yeah, if you're in the, like, having a baby, like, you go see your OBGYN, which is... The O is for obstetrics. The <laughs> G is for gynecology. gynecology. <laughs> There's some other letters. I think that's it. I think you're good. Yeah? You got the two. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. But also, I will note, those fields are largely founded by American doctors who unethically experimented on black female slaves. Mm. Like, the, like the godfather of gynecology such a weird title to have in the first yep. place. Like, I think he had a statue at some Ivy League school. I think it was Harvard. And mm -hmm. they took it down because, like, all of his early work on gynecology was just, like, forcing black female slaves to mm -hmm. participate in his, like, experiments and his research. History is so messed up, especially really medical history. Medical history in particular yeah. because it is, like, 
so much medical research, mm-hmm. like through eugenics and stuff, yep. has provided such important insights into how you can improve 100%. people's lives. But it was not done, the research not done ethically in no, any way. If you look at all of the, I mean, the research and the tests and things that happened during World War II, like yes, during like yeah. Hitler's reign in Germany, like there's many things that the medical the medical society would not know now yeah, exactly. if that hadn't happened. Because yeah. you can't just you can't just slice people's heads open. That's not cool. Yeah, no. Um exactly. but like, you know, Nazi Germany, Hitler, like he thought that was fine. And so they did crazy things. And yeah. you learned a lot. People don't get lobotomies anymore. <laughs> um, like that's great. Yeah. No, but. and it's definitely something that in university circles, even like outside of science, but especially with science, it's mm-hmm. like, how do we use the findings of unethically sourced research? Because mm-hmm. if the research, if it was obtained in an unethical way, how good, how important does the research have to be to validate its use? Yeah. Like, how many people can you save with this research? Right. Like, because for me, in, in my case anyways, you can't put the cat back in the bag. Like, yeah. You know what you know. So yeah. there's like, it's, not it's gonna, just like, it's yeah. why history is so important to me. It's like, you have yeah. to be able to have that conversation of why someone's going to be offended if you bring up that researcher. Exactly. Right? And it's like, you're saying, like, you know what you know. We know things that, like... We know things because of them being completed unethically, yeah. like tests being done and um, experiments being performed on people. But we now know those things, and you can't discredit that. Yeah, yeah. It's like like you can't say, oh, no, we're going to do it anyway, even we know that they'll actually die because we have the research right here, but we have yeah. to be ethical about it. Yeah. You can't do that. Like, that's that doesn't make sense. Because that's unethical because, in some ways. Exactly. It's just like... It's a double-edged to an, sword, for sure. Yeah, I'm really happy I'm not a doctor and I don't have yeah. to make those decisions. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, <laughs> so instead of assisting labor in the basis of an emergency, there were doctors such as Dr. Benjamin Page who wanted to take over the delivery of babies completely, putting midwifery second. So mm. essentially, previously, gynecology and obstetrics would be brought in if, like, oh, th- something's irregular, like something's not going right. Okay. But now it's suggesting like we should just, we should deliver every single baby. Like who knows how many babies have died because midwives delivered them instead of us, Ugh. basically. The education of women on the basis of midwifery was stunted by both physicians and health public health reformers, driving midwifery to be seen as out of practice. So essentially they're saying like, that's the old stuff. We've mm-hmm. got the new bigger and better stuff Mm -hmm. over here in this camp over here over here (laughs) in camp gynecology (laughs) (laughs) this was the world of medicine that jenny kid goenlock was born into in 1841 1841 good year if i could whistle if i could do that like (laughs) whistle like i have no idea what you mean (laughs) (laughs) like she's born in 1841 like Like, (laughs) no 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 like yeah, more like that one. <laughs> so Jenny was born in Kelso, Scotland to Andrew Goenlock and Elizabeth Kidd. Her parents were farmers and committed members of the Presbyterian Church. We do not know a lot about Jenny's childhood, but at six years old, the Goenlock family emigrated from Scotland to Ellis Township in Ontario, Canada. Okay. And so she immigrated to Canada. Yes. So she's not born in Canada originally. Mm. Apparently that was like semi-controversial in like... Is she a Canadian doctor if she's not born in the country? But, like, she lived here since she was six. Yeah. So I think that's sort of an irrelevant question. <laughs> yes. They purchased a thriving 10-acre farm, and the family began attending the Knox Presbyterian Church near Stratford, which we'll get to talk about Stratford because they have a heritage moment. Stratford, yeah, they do. It's weird that so many are in Ontario. Hmm. hmm. Anyways, <laughs> the best ones are in Nova Scotia, though. Yeah. The Blue Nose, excellent. Halifax Explosion. Oh, superb. So it's everyone's favorite. Classic Viola Desmond. Viola Desmond. Great. It's a great one. <laughs> you know, we the Irish have no orphans, bias. The Irish Orphans, though, that's Quebec. Yeah. And that's a great one. That is a great love one. Those. I love those. I Irish still love orphans. that episode, actually. Yeah. That episode is still fun to like, go back and listen to every once in a while. That's true. Do I listen to my own voice? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do I laugh at my own jokes? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> 
I laugh really hard at like our banter. That's the thing. It's like it's funny to go back and be like, I know what's coming, but also it's really funny. It's so funny. Yeah, and also part of it is we don't really know because Mark edits stuff out. So. Yeah. We say a Anyways. lot more ridiculous. Stuff. <laughs> yeah, you guys don't even know. You don't even know. Yeah, actually, speaking of which, if people would want to hear other kinds of content like that, they should let us know. Yeah, like leave us like a review, leave us a DM, something. If like you want to hear like bloopers or you want to hear outtakes, which are the same thing as bloopers, but um, different, but in different. a way. Also rants. We go on rants a lot that get cut yeah. because they go way off the mark. Also, we. <laughs> talk a lot before the actual recording that's starts true. we do a and warm sometimes up. that's really fun <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's actually funny because we'll go in and i was like oh i remember this one being super funny and then i'll be like it's not that it wasn't funny it's just like it's because i was remembering the conversation we had just before yeah. we started recording <laughs> yeah that's true anyways back to jenny back to um, jenny. jenny attended school in town and she was a good student in 1861, at the age of 20, Jenny finished her training at the Normal School in Toronto, which would have been a school or college for teachers. Oh, okay. So she went and got her teaching certificate. Good for her. She completed her degree in about half the time of the average student. Mm -hmm. So she's just motoring through school. She's smart. <laughs> she's very smart. With her teaching certificate, Jenny taught at public schools in the Stratford area from 1861 to 1865. Okay. So she's out and about. She's like out making her own way in the world. Good for her. In Toronto, Jenny met a man named Edward Trout. Mm -hmm. Edward sold advertising for the Toronto magazine Leader. After an extended courtship, they were married on August 25th, 1865, which I think it's only extended by our today's standards because yeah. that means i don't know exactly when they met but they would have met between 1861 and 1865 and by 1865 they're married yeah <laughs> and the two wound up settling in toronto okay edward prospered and in 1867 he and his brother john malcolm founded a highly respected financial weekly magazine called the monetary times mm -hmm. jenny however clever clever name <laughs> it's about money no and why are newspapers called times? Because I think it's like the life and times, like okay. the things that are happening in these times. That makes sense. Yeah. I feel like we don't use that word that way anymore. No. But it's like remembered in like newspapers. But it's like the New York Times. So yeah. it's like what's going on in New York. Right. Like right. what? So what's going on in money? Yeah. <laughs> monetary times that's what they should have called it what's going on in money <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly they should get you to like we should just name the magazine we should just name on. magazine the newspapers <laughs> jenny however was not doing as well as her husband <laughs> so shortly after their marriage she suffered from a series of nervous disorders that suddenly started plaguing her and they left her a semi-invalid barely able to move so just like oh. all of the sudden and it's again like when women suffer from these issues, mm -hmm. it's usually just like, oh, she has hysteria or she yeah. has whatever. So we really don't know She's what depressed. was happening. Yeah. yeah. And so even if she was, it says it's a series of nervous disorders. So, I mean, she could have had like bipolar. She mm -hmm. could have been, you know, just anxious and depressed. But we don't really know. But it basically left her bedridden. She couldn't mm -hmm. get out of bed. So she sought help from doctors who recommended treatment through the new science of electrotherapy. Oh, dear. Boop, boop, boop. But the results were good. Oh, um, okay. I feel like that's something that gets really Her brain negatively didn't totally represented. Mush. No, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thankfully, they didn't put the probes on her brain. <laughs> yeah, the results were good, and they offered Jenny some relief from her maladies. This stint of poor health and the positive experience she had had with her doctors led Jenny to pursue medicine as a career. Good for her. So, yeah, it's like this really positive experience that she has. She's like, oh, I want to be able to do that. Yeah. And so she tries to get into medicine. Mm -hmm. Jenny Trout's husband encouraged her dream of becoming a doctor by supporting her financially and emotionally. Isn't that just great? <laughs> I love it. Dream. <laughs> That's the dream. <laughs> That's, That's it. That's it, folks. Imagine your wife being like, I think I want to become a doctor. And you're like, no. No. <laughs> Are you kidding me? That's horrible. Ugh. Yeah. But Edward's not one of those. Edward's a good one. Thank God. In 1869, Jenny and Edward moved in with female physician Emily Stowe and her family at their home on Church Street in Toronto. Okay. So Emily Stowe, for a long time, was like, 
the first female doctor a lot of people knew about That's in cool. Canada. So she's like, she was the one. And then they were like, oh, Jenny Trout actually got licensed before Emily Stowe. Oh, really? So Emily, like, yeah. So Emily is practicing and she has a medical degree from the U.S., but she doesn't have an official Canadian license. Oh, OK. Yeah. So Emily is about 10 years older than Jenny and had been fighting against the medical system to educate and practice since the 1840s. Wow. Emily was denied entrance into Toronto School of Medicine in 1865 and was told by its vice principal, quote, the doors of the university are not open to women and I trust they never will be, end quote. (laughs) Who is that guy? Doesn't list his name, but... uh, (laughs) That's not a quote you want associated with yourself, especially nope. when you're just so flagrantly wrong. <laughs> nope. Oh, my God. I hate people. I hate people. Unable to study in Canada, Emily earned her degree in the United States from the Homeopathic New York Medical College for Women in 1867. So that's Good the other her. thing. Like The U.S. has a ton of medical colleges for women, and C- Canada is just really far behind on that notion. <laughs> Canada's just like, nope, sorry, we're just like... Sorry, still, can't help you. <laughs> we're still just fighting about a flag. <laughs> yeah. We don't even have a flag yet. Yeah. And you want us to give you a medical degree? Uh, how can we Are have... Are you crazy? How can we have women in hospitals? <laughs> Are you crazy? How will your tiny hands fit all the tools? <laughs> what if you ever have to see a penis? What do we do? What if you have your God forbid period? Oh, my God. Don't talk about it. Please lock yourself in a room (laughs) for about a month. I just can't. I just can't. I just can't. I just can't. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) So the same year, in 1867, Emily returned to Canada and opened a medical practice in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Emily gained some local prominence through public lectures on women's health and maintained a steady clientele through newspaper advertisements. Wow. So Jenny and Emily... In the monetary times, maybe? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Other times. Medical times. Women times. Need a doctor times. (laughs) Just ads times. That's my favorite one. Uh, That's the paper that I read. Just ads times. Just the ads times. You just open, you're like, mm, mm, wow, it's just the, the Baconator ads. is $2 <laughs> off this week when you buy a Frosty. <laughs> um, Shout out to Wendy's Canada. Oh, yes. Sponsor us. So, yeah, like, Wendy's, you have my heart. Your Twitter account is hilarious, and so I like funny. you more than McDonald's. Yeah, please sponsor us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jenny and Emily became close friends and associates, and together they championed the women's cause in medicine. Mm-hmm. So they're kind of like, and they show that in the heritage. It's her and Emily that are sitting in the class together. In the 1870s, no women were officially admitted to any Canadian medical school. Women were forced to study internationally, usually in the United States, like Emily Stowe had done. Mm -hmm. However, just because they had degrees, it doesn't mean women could just then go practice in Ontario. Of course not. More hoops. Yeah, like, I know that Emily has her practice, and I don't understand exactly how it gets licensed, but... All U.S. graduates at the time are required to attend one session at an Ontario medical school and take the matriculation exam of the College of Physicians and Surgeons before they could be licensed in the province. Mm. So I believe that Emily is practicing without a license or at least an Ontario license okay? because she can't get into the class. So Mm. the way that they prevent like, yes, you have a degree, but you cannot practice in Ontario or you can't get licensed in Ontario until you pass this exam and you take at least one course from an Ontario medical college. So that's what her like Jenny and Emily are facing up against. They're not even trying to get their degrees in Canada. They're like, we just need to take a course so Mm. we can get licensed. So that's what they want. (laughs) So under considerable pressure from, I believe, U.S. universities. So U.S. universities are like, you're not acknowledging our graduates. Mm -hmm. Like they have medical degrees, but you're not letting them into your college so that they can get licensed. Mm -hmm. So the Toronto School of Medicine came under considerable pressure and they agreed to admit Emily Stowe and Jenny Trout for one session and only on the condition that they did not make any complaints to the university. So they're like, you're going to come in, you're going to sit down, you're going to shut up, you're going to like it. And that's it. <laughs> you don't get to fight for anything. Oh my God. 
So Emily already had her degree, so this was presumably so she could get officially licensed in Ontario. But this was Jenny's first medical course, like her first session. Oh, wow. So she's going to do this, and then she'll go get her degree elsewhere. Okay. By all accounts, Emily and Jenny's experiences were horrible. Mm-hmm. Many of the professors and male peers were actively hostile towards them. This typically came in the form of trying to shock the sensibilities of these two like Victorian matrons. So they're both like... Their wives. Emily is yeah. a mother. So it's just kind of like they're trying to shock them into not coming back. Right. Hence, they show in the minute like they're yelling at them and they're like bringing up their sex lives in front of all of their yep. male peers and their male peers are laughing at them. Yeah. This was all done to send a message, which is we don't want you here mm-hmm. and we don't want any other women in this male space. Like this is a men's space. She and we don't just, want you here. I mean, and I get it. It's history. But <laughs> thank gosh. Thank gosh. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty rough. But the two women stuck it out and they finished the session. Mm-hmm. And then Jenny moved on to the Women's Medical College in Philadelphia, an okay. institution noted for its Christian orientation. So Jenny remains a really strong Presbyterian throughout okay. the, her whole life. Good for so her. she's going to a Christian you school. Know, Presbyterian Church in Lunenburg has the best squares for events. They're like, <laughs> they're like church, they're choirs. Who's the, their source? Yeah, the ladies who make the squares, mm, they're good. Yeah. She received her medical degree in March of 1875 and a month later passed with relative ease the licensing examinations of the College of Physicians of the Surgeons of Ontario. Because ladies aren't dumb. Because she's really smart. She, she already finished breezed her, through normal yeah, school. She, and she finished her teaching degree in two years. Yeah. She's, she's here. Or like, she I knows. don't know if it was two years, but half the time of what it was supposed to take. Yeah, exactly. She thus became the first woman doctor authorized to practice in Canada, and she would remain unique in that regard until 1888 when Emily Stowe was officially licensed. Aww. So she wins. Ha <laughs> ha. She is a winner. It's not a race. We but don't like losers here at the Minute Women Podcast. We don't like losers. Sorry. Uh, yeah, we've, we've already got two of them. We can't have any more. Yeah, we're not more losers. <laughs> So in Toronto in July of 1875, Dr. Jenny Trout and her close Mm -hmm. personal friend, um, Emily Amelia Teft. There's a lot of Emilys in this episode. Oh, this is a different Emily. Different Emily. Emily Teft, uh, another graduate of the Women's Medical College, started their practice, which featured, quote, special facilities for giving treatments to ladies by galvanic baths or electricity. So like galvanization um which is the process that's described in the first frankenstein like the original frankenstein yeah they used galvanic like electricity to bring him back to life Mm -hmm. uh but it was a very common like medical practice okay (laughs) it's essentially just more electrotherapy Electrotherapy was highly regarded among late victorian physicians and in 1877 doctors jenny and emily launched the Medical and Electrotherapeutic Institute in the three houses north of Jenny's home on Jarvis Street. Okay. So they have like three properties, and this is where they're opening their institute. Good for them. Around 60 female patients lived at it, and about 40 of them were treated each day. So you actually have women living in the quarters as well. And it's for women for the most part. Mm Mm-hmm. Eventually, Jenny and Emily created branches in Hamilton and Bradford. Jenny's Christian faith also inspired her to open a free dispensary for patients who could not afford to pay. So she's also like doing. Oh, she's a nice. philanthropist. I know. She's, she's actually nice really lady. great. She's really nice. In order to help cover the costs of the free dispensary, uh, Jenny took on speaking engagements in cities such as Toronto, Hamilton, Brantford, and Meaford. So she's going and she's like speaking and she's talking about like women's education and women Very in medicine. Cool. Yeah. The speaking fees were not enough to cover the cost of the free dispensary, however, so it had to be closed six Aww. months after it opened. That's really sad. Yeah, I know. So Jenny and Emily's vast undertaking was very popular. However, the Medical and Electrotherapeutic Institute proved to be a losing investment. And its heavy personal demands kind of wore down Jenny, who is still, she's still like medically kind of frail herself. She suffers from her own chronic ill health issues. Right. So they, towards the end of 1882, she was forced to announce her retirement from the medical profession at the young age of 41. That's so sad. Yeah. So that's the thing. It's all just like money issues. Like Mm. the Institute's really popular. They just don't have enough money to keep it open, which is, yeah, it's a shame. That's sad. Because it's like 
female doctors working for female patients yeah. in like the 1870s. Like I feel like that's so really ahead of its lack time. Of support. Yeah. This severe disappointment was mitigated by the rise of a new cause, the establishment of a women's medical college in Canada. So Jenny mm. has like a new passion. She's like, okay. we're going to do something else. Mm, we're going to do it up. <laughs> In 1883, Jenny offered $10,000 to set up a medical college for women in Toronto. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. I think her and her husband are quite well off. Like, okay. her husband's business is very profitable. She's still a doctor. Like, I still think she makes yeah. quite a bit of money. They also don't have any children. So right. they no they can take care of themselves. No one's sucking them dry, you know? <laughs> no leeches around. <laughs> yeah. In 1883, Dr. Michael Barrett and five male colleagues at Toronto School of Medicine had, on their own initiative, formed themselves into the faculty of a prospective women's institution that would be opened in Toronto. Mm. So there's already six male doctors at the Toronto School. They're like, we would be a faculty for a women's medical college. That's cool. Those so guys you, are allies. Yes, they are trying to help. I don't know if it's like they feel this sense or they're like, wow, there's money to be made here if we let female but students you know, in. But even if there is... Either or. It's also a time where, like, the prejudice could have, the like, the prejudice, sorry, could have been so strong that, like, it would have just been, like, women in medicine, we'll put our money elsewhere. Like. Yeah, exactly. So, so the fact that they're even supporting that is big. Yeah, we got some people behind her now. Yeah. Jenny was willing to endorse the move with both her influence and her money, but only if women constituted a majority of the trustees and filled at least some of the positions on the faculty. Mm -hmm. So she's like, I'm not going to put my money and support behind a medical college that is designed by men and run by men yeah women need to participate in its its yeah in the bones yeah, yeah. this was a reasonable stipulation as there would shortly be several all canadian graduates who could take those junior staff positions mm -hmm. so augusta stowe emily stowe's daughter was studying medicine at the toronto school of medicine and was due to graduate that year mm -hmm. there were three girls attending queen's medical program who would graduate in 1884 and another two who would graduate in 1885 so there's no lack of female talent in the right. field of medicine right. so it's not like she's like i want female doctors to be teaching the courses and they're like well there are no female female doctors and it's like there no are... these female doctors yeah they're right here these ones yeah plus the many more who are coming up through that program yeah exactly however barrett who was opposed to having any female trustees at all rejected all of these demands <laughs> so barrett's like i want your money and i want your support but i, I don't want to i don't want your help yeah <laughs> and Jenny... your voice and no thank you uh, no thank you your opinions <laughs> keep them you can yourself. keep them to yourself <laughs> yeah <laughs> And Jenny wasn't willing to compromise any of her stipulations. Yeah, girl, get it. And so she throws her support to a more obliging group in Kingston, which was organizing a school in affiliation with Queen's College. Nice. So she's like, oh, you won't listen to me? Well, I'll take my money elsewhere. Thank you very much. See ya. Bye. Queens was glad to accept. Yeah. There had recently been an alarming outbreak of student unrest because of the presence of women there. And the university was in no mood to object to Jenny's demands. Cool. So I think there's already like been a lot of like tension around the women in the mm -hmm. classroom. So they're like, we can go and make an all women's medical college. Perfect. Let's, Let's go do, do that. <laughs> That'll kill two birds with one stone. Two birds, one stone. And yes, we'll take your money. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> After the founding of the Women's Medical College was approved at a public meeting in Kingston on the 8th of June, 1883, Dr. Jenny Trout became not only one of its trustees, but also its principal benefactor, promising $2,000 a year for the next five years. Mm. It, therefore, came as a shock when she found out four days later that Barrett and his associates had created the Medi Women's Medical College in Toronto with the support of Jenny's friend and now rival Emily Stowe <gasps> and the Canadian Women's Suffrage Emily. Association. Right? I was reading it. I was like, <gasps> that backstabbing bitch. Hussy. Oh. Well. Or bitch. <laughs> We're not in sync today. She's one of the two. <laughs> but yeah, I was just like, no. That is, they uh, just went and found another female women, doctor who has a lot of money and they're like, will you do it? And she's like, yeah, sure. Women need Because to her women. daughter is in the school. No. Like Emily's daughter goes to the Toronto Medical College. Ugh. So yes. of course she's going to support it. Yeah. Ugh. Makes me so mad. Barrett, 
obviously afraid that his plans would be preempted by the Kingston group, was now willing to willing to accept women on both the board of trustees and the faculty. Good. So Emily was like. I'll do it under Jenny's stipulations. And they were like, yeah, we're willing to do that now because Kingston did it. Already did it. Yeah. Jenny's husband, Edward, spoke out on behalf of his wife in the press and denounced Barrett's, quote, complete change of heart, end quote, and claimed his action, this action was grossly unfair to the Kingston College. Mm -hmm. There were hardly enough prospective students to warrant the expense of establishing two colleges for women. So that's the other thing is that once you have two women's colleges, you're draining resources from each other rather than just supporting each other and supporting women in medicine. Less competition over the education of women as doctors would mean fewer of the resources needed to be split. Mm -hmm. Neither side would yield, however, and in October, two women's medical colleges were launched. Mm -hmm. Emily ensured that her daughter was appointed the first woman staff member, uh, which was the demonstrator of anatomy. That was her job. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Which I feel like is a callback to the Heritage Minute. Boobs. (laughs) Penis. (laughs) Yeah. That's it. (laughs) That's all anatomy. (laughs) As previously stated, there were not enough students for both of these schools. Right. The bitter rivalry between Kingston and Toronto colleges deeply divided the small and struggling community, which the Toronto Daily Mail called the <laughs> Lady Medicos. <laughs> what? I don't know. That's what they're calling the students. The Lady Medicos. Medicos. <laughs> like M-E-D-I-C-O? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I don't know why. Because they're not doctors. And they're not students. They're medicos. Medicos. Yeah. Like co-eds? Maybe. I don't know. The competition for students was heightened in the 1890s with several Canadian medical faculties opening to women, including that of Bishop's College. So Mm. now there's like three colleges, which is good. Yeah. But there's still just not that many women going into medicine to justify it. But that's so Bishop's. (laughs) <laughs> I don't Just know much like about bishops. A little behind the time. <laughs> Is it in Toronto as well? Bishops? No, Quebec. Quebec. Oh, okay. Yeah. Strife within the community did not end until 1894 when the two female schools united to form oh. the Ontario Medical College for Women in the provincial capital. That's so, exciting. Dr. Jenny Trout had served on the Kingston Bodies Board of Trustees until the end and had remained one of its principal financial patrons. Mm-hmm. So she's there from the founding to not the fall, but the yeah. amalgamation with Toronto, which is like there was an easier way to do that. Yeah. It's just like annoying that they had to go on this like long winding path to get there. Yeah. After her retirement from medicine, Jenny Trout grew interested in Bible study and became involved in Christian mission works overseas. Mm. So she's still very active. Good for her. Um, Jenny was also involved in temperance. She acted as the vice president and later the president of the Women's Temperance Union. She was also the vice president of the Association for the Advancement of Women. Moreover, yeah, she's, you know, she's out there. She's a cool lady. I know. She's like, I'm going to be a teacher. Never mind. I'm going to be a doctor. Never mind. I'm going to be an activist. She's just all over the place. I love it. Never mind. I'm going to be me. Moreover, after a family tragedy, Jenny and Edward, who had had no children of their own, adopted their orphaned great nephew and great niece. So now they have two, like, dependents in their lives. Little babies. Yeah. In 1903, Jenny Trout and her husband bought some land in Florida and built a winter home there. In Florida. Yeah. They are the... I feel like that's... They're the first. They're the original snowbirds. Exactly. (laughs) They split their time between their homes in Florida and Toronto. In 1908, the Trout family moved permanently to the United States, nice. settling in Hollywood, California. Ooh. Uh, and that's where they live for the rest of their life. And wow. Jenny died on the 10th of November, 1921, in Hollywood. Huh. Yeah. But, so, like I mentioned earlier, Jenny for a long time isn't really known about yeah. in Canadian medical circles. Yeah. Jenny Trout was the first woman to receive a medical license in Canada and was pivotal in the formation of Canada's first women's medical colleges. However, for most of Canada's medical history, she's hardly mentioned. Why? Why, Grace? Tell me why. I will tell you why. Okay, I'm ready. (laughs) You ready for this? Yep. Uh, Fastening my seatbelt. Spoiler alert, it's petty. Um, I feel like most of... it, It is so... Like, that stuff is really interesting to me of, like, how... 
really just very basic human gestures and human emotions do Mm -hmm. really impact how things get remembered. Mm -hmm. And so as we'll get into, there's like, it's basically a pretty petty reason Jenny doesn't show up in a lot of history books for a long time. Jenny had no standard uh, biography written about her. Her obituary was not published in the Canadian Medical Association's journal, Hmm. which is a very strange occurrence given that most of the pioneer women in the field of medicine were given at least a few lines in the journal uh, when they passed away, and some had very long entries. Despite Jenny's significance, she was largely forgotten to history until 1974 when Carlotta Hacker wrote The Indomitable Lady Doctors. I love that. This is a great name for a book. That's Indomitable Lady Doctors. (laughs) That would be a great name for a podcast. The Lady Doctors? The the Indomitable Indomitable Lady Lady Doctors. Doctors. Yeah, if uh, we ever start a a medical doctor spinoff. Yeah. We can interview only female doctors, <laughs> but we'll always call them lady doctors. Always. That's You're so a bizarre. Lady doctor. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's like I don't even know. What's a, what's another job? If you had a mechanic, it's like, oh, it's the lady mechanic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It feels a little sexist. Oh, definitely. But it's funny. It's the lady, lady cashier at the grocery store. <laughs> the lady one. <laughs> you know which one. <laughs> So in this book, Hacker recounted the struggle to open the Canadian medical profession to women and compiled accounts of the remarkable women who fought this struggle. Mm -hmm. Hacker was convinced that this lack of acknowledgement was an indication that Jenny just hadn't contributed that much to Canada's medical field. But as Hacker said, quote, each time I decided to forget her, she would swim back into view, generally alongside Emily Stowe, Mm -hmm. end quote. So she's like... They don't write about her that much, so she just must not be that important. But then right. every time she's going into the archives and looking in the history, she's like, this this Jenny Trout is always here. Always like, there. why does no one talk about her? Hacker explains Jenny's absence as being retaliation from the Stowe's, who wanted to punish her for her lack of compliance over the founding of the medical colleges. Oh, my God. So in 1906, Dr. Augusta Stowe Gullen, so that's Emily's daughter, Mm -hmm. published A Brief History of the Ontario Medical College of Women. The booklet did not mention the role Jenny Trout played in the founding of the school. It didn't mention her at all. The publication gave the impression that the Toronto Women's College had been the only one established in 1883 and that it alone had taken the lead in offering medical education to women in Canada. But that's all wrong. But that's all wrong and really, really biased. Oh, that's so dumb. (laughs) She shouldn't have been allowed to write it. No. (laughs) It seemed Jenny had been lost to history simply because the more famous Stowe's had avoided mentioning her. So they're not like renouncing her but they're just like we're not going to even talk about the Kingston school Which and we're not going to talk worse. about Jenny. Yeah, and it's worse because like like Jenny and Edward lived in their home. Yeah. Like they were friends. Yeah. And then just like 10 years later they're like, "Oh, never mind. Oh, so going to forget all that." <laughs> I hate that. Equally relevant to the lack of Jenny's lasting memory was her character. Jenny was a very retiring person who did not like the spotlight of mm-hmm. public life. So even though she's part of all these organizations, like that's like the speaking tour thing that, you mm-hmm. know, Nellie McClung did and Emily yeah. Stowe does, she just doesn't do that that's not as her much. Thing. Yeah. Emily Stowe, on the other hand, thrived on publicity. Despite her activism, Jenny largely withdrew from Toronto society by the middle of her life and left the country altogether. Yeah. So that's the other thing. She lives, you know, the back two in decades Hollywood. of her life in Hollywood. Emily Stowe was an active public figure until her death. She was still advocating for women's rights when she passed away. Which is funny. That she's such a women's rights advocate. I know. Like, yeah. So hypocritical. Yeah. Like, does she look in the mirror every once in a while and, like, yeah. realize that it's just more I'm important? all about women's rights advocates as long as you know that I started <laughs> that it. That I started and it. And you're welcome. Exactly. Praise me. Um... Emily would host public and private functions well into her 60s. Jenny, on the other hand, was more obscure to the public and was overshadowed by her more famous counterpart. So dumb. So it's like when we want to go looking through the history books for a pioneer female doctor, well, or lady doctor, (laughs) uh, we'll probably say Emily Stowe instead of Jenny Trout for a very long time. Mm. 
Following Hacker's book, Jenny became more known to the Canadian public. Mm -hmm. In 1991, she was featured on a postage stamp to commemorate her as the first woman licensed to practice medicine in Canada. For those of you who don't listen to the podcast all the time, like that's when you know you've made it. You've made it if you're on a stamp. Yeah, if you're in, if you're a Canadian icon and you're on a postage stamp, that's it. That's it. You've made it. You're successful. Yeah, you've elevated yourself. I strive for that level of success. What if we get a minute women stamp? Oh my god, that'd be so cool. And as Hacker explained, Jenny and Emily do not need to be remembered as rivals. Like Mm -hmm. She's like, we shouldn't continue that like women bashing part of the history, but rather as two extremely important physicians in Canada's history. They're both independently very important. They just happen to cross paths every once in a while. Right. Dr. Jenny Trout was not only the first licensed female doctor in Canada, but also a dedicated physician who contributed significantly to the advancement of women in medicine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's pretty awesome. I know. That was a good one to start off the new season. Also, we made it through this whole episode without making a fish pun. Yeah. That's pretty good. That I think pretty good. I think our comedy has matured. Our comedy has matured. It's grown. I mean, we giggled at the word penis. But, but just um, a little. You know. Just a we little. have to stay youthful. Yeah. We have to stay relatable for the kids. I mean, I just <laughs> turned 26 yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, I'm old now. She's old. So. JK, she's young. So, yeah. Thriving. Trying to be... Trying to be mature. Trying to be mature about these things. So we didn't make any trout or fish puns. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome, audience. (laughs) (laughs) But Um, this is good. I like I like when we get to feature some ladies. Oh, a hundred percent for sure. It's always a really it's always really good. Like I think it's good. And she's really not that controversial a figure, which I also appreciate. Like Nellie McClung, you're like, oh, big asterisk. She's yeah. got some other stuff She's going on in the, the Woodhouse. You should go listen to our episode on Nellie McClung if you want to know should. all about that. Whoa, Nellie. Whoa, Nellie. Tell you. <laughs> um, but. Jenny just seems to be like, she's like, no, I just want to be a doctor and I want women to have those opportunities and like and, reasonable things. Yeah. And she seems like, I feel like it was always related to a stable home life. Like, yeah. She seems to have a very stable home life yeah. throughout her whole life. Sounds and, like her husband loves her and yeah. And like stuck with her through hard times. Yeah. I love that. It's good stuff. We started season one with uh, John A and that True. was turbulent. Turbulent. So, turbulent. Yeah. We tried to keep it a steady course yeah. this time. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thank you so much all for listening. And we always appreciate it if you can uh, pop over to our social media channels and give us a follow. Uh, we're on Instagram at Men and Women Podcast and Facebook at the same name. And then we're also on Twitter at The Minute Women. Uh, it's always really nice to get direct messages from you guys and to uh, to know what you think about the episodes yeah. and to hear any ideas that you have or... Uh, Again, please correct us if we're wrong. We really appreciate that. So thank you so much. Yeah, we'll do it in our little sorry segments. Yeah. And if you guys want to leave us a review on whatever platform that you're listening to this podcast on, it's a really big help to us. Uh, But yeah, make sure you rate, subscribe, download the episodes of the podcast wherever you're listening to it. We also have a website where you Mm -hmm. can get all the episodes of the podcast. Um, There's links to all our social media channels as well as the uh, bibliographical sources that we use in the research of these episodes. So like if you want to go yeah. read a uh, hacker's book, then you can find a source to that on the sources page. And it's also a really aesthetically pleasing website. It's a very beautiful website. So. Squarespace sponsor us. Yes. <laughs> Squarespace. We're and here. yeah, and you can find our website at minutewomenpodcast.ca. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.